Well, praise the Lord, everybody. It's another great morning here at 153greatfish.com. And uh, we're going to conclude our Isaiah studies today with number five. Um, but before we do, I'd just like us all to pray for the victims and the people of uh, Great Britain who are at war with ISIS, the Islamic State. Jesus, I pray for Great Britain. I pray for Theresa May, the Prime Minister. I pray, Lord God, for all the people that were hurt yesterday uh, by the uh, terrorist act. I pray, God, that you'd help uh, the Muslims, the people that believe in uh, Islam, Orthodox Muslims, to come into the faith of Jesus Christ and to learn to be peaceable and to love their neighbors. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, that's kind of the thing that's going on, and uh, so we just wanted to get that on the table here so that uh, we can pray for these people. If it happened in your neighborhood, you'd certainly want prayer. God bless. Okay, here we go to the PowerPoint, and we're going to talk about our friend Isaiah and every impact that he's had in the New Testament, and that's what we want to talk about today. So here's our outline. We're going to look at some New Testament statistics. We're going to see some of the greatest quotations of Isaiah. We're going to see some of the selected themes. There's many themes in Isaiah. I just selected a few. We're going to talk about Paul, the epistles, Romans, and Isaiah. And uh, you could consider Paul to be the greatest consumer of Isaiah. You might want to think of him that way. So let's do a review from last week's study. We talked about the three main sections of Isaiah. They are Isaiah 1 through 39, talking about the fall of Samaria until the restoration by Hezekiah. Isaiah 40 through 55, which foretold the deportation by Babylon and the Persian empires. And then Isaiah 56 through 66, which really talked about from the time of, uh, uh, I guess, uh, uh, after the uh, uh, fall of the uh, Persian empire, really until the time of Jesus and John the Baptist. And let's see here. Whoops. I'm going to give you the time periods now. 740 to 687 B.C., 605 to 536 B.C., and uh, 536 to 33 A.D. Those are the three main sections of Isaiah. We just reviewed them. Now, the greatest theme that's found in Isaiah is that justice and righteousness are unattainable, unattainable without the Messiah. That's really what the book of Isaiah is telling us, is that people try, they have a reform, and they fall back in the old in the old uh, uh, patterns. So the Messiah is going to come to Judah, he's going to come to all of Israel, Jerusalem, and the Gentile world, and that's how justice and righteousness are established. Now, in the New Testament, in the Gentile world, our righteousness is provided by the blood of Jesus Christ. He becomes our righteousness. We cannot establish it on our own. And I guess that would be the greatest theme of Isaiah. You cannot establish your own righteousness. You need the Messiah, the blood of Jesus Christ. So here's the three most quoted Old Testament books by Jesus. Now this is Jesus quoting Isaiah, or the, I'm sorry, the uh, Old Testament books. And these are the three most frequently quoted by him. Number one is the Psalms. He quoted it seven or 11 times. The question is, is he the son of God? That's the major quotation found in Psalm 110. And in fact, not only is he the son of God, he is the God of David. That's what that Psalm proves. Deuteronomy, he, Jesus quoted from it 10 times, and then he enhanced the Shema, Matthew 10, 27. You're to love the Lord thy God with all, our, all your heart, strength, soul, and mind, but you're to love your neighbor as yourself. He added to the Shema, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. You shall love him with your heart, soul, strength, and mind, and your neighbor as yourself. Consider that uh, at the advent of the Messiah, he enhances the Shema. And then the book of Isaiah, it says seven times there, and uh, we're going to go through these seven times that Jesus quoted it. Number one, Isaiah 61, 1 through 2, he heals the blind and he brings good news. Isaiah 6, 9 through 10, he speaks in parables that cannot be understood without the spirit of truth. If you want to know who Jesus is, you're going to need the spirit of truth to reveal it to you. People try all, you know, all day long to try to explain who Jesus is. I had one man tell me, Dwight, I can explain the Trinity better than anybody. Well, you can't take God's place. If you want to reveal who Jesus is, it requires the Holy Ghost, the Spirit of Truth, the Teacher of Righteousness. Also, the, the house of God is to be a house of prayer, Isaiah 56, 7. Now, we are the house of God, okay? The individual believer. And we're to pray. 
and uh, he gave us the model prayer to know how to pray. They said, teach us to pray. He also said that the Pharisees will give lip service, not heart service. This is found in Isaiah 29, 13. He quoted that scripture, trying to tell them where they were at spiritually. And we've all heard that phrase, lip service. Isaiah 5, 1, he quoted it, the parable of the vineyard. Actually, it's a, an allusion to it. And the vineyard uh, refers to the, uh, the, the vineyard song that's found in Isaiah 5, 1. Uh, there are four songs in the book of Isaiah. That was just one of them. Isaiah 53, 12, he foretells that he will die a sinner's death. That means that not that he was a sinner, but that sinners were put to death through a capital punishment process. That's what he was foretelling. And then Isaiah 54, 13, uh, his ministry is in reality God teaching the people what the Old Testament means. And they'll all be taught by God. And he begins that and he quotes that particular passage. Those are the seven times Jesus directly quotes the book of Isaiah. Now, here's some New Testament quotations of the book of Isaiah, a total of 63 times. Uh, the four Gospels quote Isaiah 21 times. Paul's 13 epistles quote it 25 times. Uh, specifically, the book of Romans is the majority of them. Hebrews quotes it a couple of times, 1 Peter six times, Acts five times, and Revelation four times. That's how important the uh, book of Isaiah is to the New Testament. Very, very important. And here's the six great themes of Isaiah. We went through one of them already. So he talks about the glory and the greatness of God. Okay, the glory of God, uh, Isaiah does. Then he says that God is one, that he alone is holy, and he alone is the Savior. That's interesting. If he alone is the Savior, who is Jesus Christ? None other but Yahweh in flesh. And he's one God. Now, it's a mystery how God can be come a man. Now, it's an abomination if a man makes himself into God, but it's the mystery of godliness when God becomes a man. I just wanted to point that out. The next theme is, we talked about this already, that sin, which is the lack of justice, social justice and righteousness of both Israel and the Gentile nations, brings judgment. That's one of the huge themes of Isaiah, and only the Messiah can bring justice and righteousness. And then Isaiah foretells the captivity and the restoration of the Jews, the captivity in Babylon. He foretells the first and second coming of the Messiah. And the sixth one, he foretells a coming great tribulation and a glorious millennium. These are the six greatest themes of Isaiah. And then he foretells uh, certain events. Number one, he foretells the captivity of Judah in Babylon. He even names Cyrus by name. And of course, the Jews certainly took their copy of Isaiah and showed it to Cyrus the king before he set them free in 536 BC. He foretold about the voice crying in the wilderness. That's John the Baptist, and his message was, repent. He foretold the virgin birth of the Messiah. I see that number is missing there. That would be number three. This would be number four. Uh, he foretold the Messiah's ministry of healing and opening blind eyes. Uh, he foretold the Messiah's suffering. He foretold Satan's fallen judgment. That's found in Isaiah 13 and 14. Uh, nowhere else in the Bible other than Ezekiel is Satan described uh, with, with what his ministry is and his fall and his judgment, his original ministry. And uh, he foretells of the great tribulation and he foretells that all Israel was to be saved. He foretells of the battle of Armageddon and he foretells about the millennium of, of peace and prosperity. And he foretells about new heavens and new earth. And that's interesting. So let's go through these 10 things. Uh, the captivity of Judah, the voice crying in the wilderness, and the virgin birth of the Messiah, Messiah's ministry of healing, Messiah's suffering, Satan's fall, great tribulation of all Israel to be saved, battle of Armageddon, millennium of peace and prosperity, new heavens and new earth. Now well, that's a lot. Those are different time periods that he's foretold. Isaiah is a probably the most tremendous book of prophecy found in the Old Testament. So here's the three most significant, significant quotations found in the book of Isaiah. They're interesting, and we need to examine them. In the synagogue of Nazareth, Jesus quotes Isaiah 60, 1 through 2. They're going to throw him off a cliff for, for quoting this. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the good news. You can read about that in Luke 4, 16 through 21. And that's probably the uh, greatest uh, quotation of the book of Isaiah by Jesus himself. Then the second greatest one is the church age where Philip and Ethiopian eunuch meet. 
And uh, the, the Ethiopian eunuch is reading Isaiah 53, 7 through 8. And uh, the Holy Ghost tells Philip to jump on the chariot and talk to uh, the, the eunuch. And, and uh, Philip says to him, do you know what you're reading? And the eunuch replied, how should I be able to understand this except somebody would guide me? And he called Philip near to come up to sit with him in the chariot. You can read about this uh, encounter in Acts 8, 27 through 35. And what's interesting about this encounter is that uh, Isaiah 53 is used to evangelize Jewish people, of which an Ethiopian eunuch is Jewish. And then finally, Paul's defense in Rome is the third greatest quotation. This is found in Isaiah 6, 9 through 10. Paul concludes his defense and he says, uh, quotes God saying, this people's heart is wax dull and their eyes are blind, but the Gentiles will listen. That's a paraphrase of this quotation. And uh, Paul does that in Acts 28, 24 through 27. These are the three greatest quotations of Isaiah in the New Testament. And we have six revelations of Isaiah. And these are, are concepts that did not exist in Judaism until after Isaiah wrote. First is that there's a council of angels called the seraphim. They surround God's throne in heaven. And the early ministry of Lucifer is described along with his exile from the heavenly temple. Also that God alone is holy and his path is a highway of holiness. Uh, the word path uh, in the Hebrew is derek. Many young men around the world are named derek. God's name is, here we go, holy, holy, holy. Now, many people have been taught that this describes the Trinity, three holies. <laughs> That's not what it means at all. When you concatenate Hebrew words together, okay, it amplifies the meaning. This is triple concatenation. It's not a doublet, it's a triplet. Holy, 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 and the Hebrew is Kadesh, Kadesh, Kadesh. We're going to get into that here at the end of this Bible study. That Messiah is going to be both a lamb and a lion. He first came in his first advent as a lamb. He's a lamb slain for us. And uh, he also comes as a second advent as a lion. And it's going to be a fearful time for those who don't give their lives to the Lord and repent of their sins. And then he shows us that there's going to be a new earth and a galaxy and universe are coming. When he says new heavens and earth. He's not talking about God's domain, the heaven, I don't believe. I think he's talking about the uh, you know space-time travel. There's going to be a new galaxy, new universe is coming along with the new earth. Uh, maybe he's going to plant us in another galaxy. I mean, that's a thought I've had uh, and destroy the planet earth and we're going to get a new earth and a new Jerusalem. I mean, God has a plan. There's a reason why people are so fascinated with star travel. The Bible says that the stars declare the glory of God. Uh, and we're going to find out uh, after the millennium what this is all about. God's going to burn the earth. He will not get a burning permit from the environmentalists. Kadesh and Hayah. Okay, and this is where I'm going to conclude the Bible study today. Holy, holy, holy. So the first time we encounter this is found in Isaiah 6, 1 through 4. And let's read that together. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. Above it stood the seraphim. Now these are a unique class of angels. Each one had six wings. Now with two wings, he covered his face. Whose face is the angel covering? God's face. Because God cannot be seen, and he hides behind the angel so that his face is not seen. He told Moses that he could not see his face. Elijah wrapped his face. Jacob uh, thought he saw God, but yet the Bible tells us he wrestled with an angel. And so this is typical of God. He doesn't reveal his face in any way other than in the face of Jesus Christ. So this is Old Testament. So he's covering God's face, and with two wings he covered God's feet, and with two he's flying. And one angel, one seraphim, shouted unto another and said, Kadesh, 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 holy, 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 is, this is the Old Testament name of God, the Yahweh Tetragrammaton, Yahweh of armies of hosts, the whole earth is full of his glory, which is the word kavod, meaning the fire of God. The doorposts of the temple shook at the voice of the shouting angels, and the house was filled with smoke. Well, what's really going on here when they say holy, holy, holy? They are lifting their wings, covering God's face. They are worshiping the name of God. That's what's going on. And so when you worship the name of God by lifting your wings, and of course, in an Old Testament sense, your hands 
do spell the Old Testament name of God, Yahweh. And when you lift up your holy hands, you are worshiping through sign language, if you will, the name of God. And that's why the kavod falls and the house is filled with smoke. Now, inside the smoke is the fire, okay? The smoke always covers the fire. That's what's going on in the temple. And so this is repeated again for us by John the Revelator in Revelation 4, 6 through 9. Let's read that now. Now, we get some more details that we didn't get from Isaiah. John seeing something even more incredible. He sees before the throne there was a sea of glass like unto crystal. In the middle of the throne and around about the throne were four beasts. Now, the Bible in, in uh, the Greek calls them beasts or creatures, but they're clearly the seraphim. Now, notice what he sees. He sees that they're full of eyes on the front and the back, before and behind. And the four seraphim had each of them six wings about him. And they, their seraphim, they're, they were full of eyes within and without, and they rest not day and night, saying, guess what? Holy, 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 Kadesh, Kadesh, Kadesh. Now, notice they say, Lord God Almighty. We never see in the Bible in the Old Testament, God the Lord. It's always Lord God, Yahweh Elohim. Yahweh is the only God. Then we see this word Almighty, which is El Shaddai in the Old Testament. They are pronouncing, they are describing, and they are worshiping the name of God which was, and that's the word I am in the Old Testament, and is, which is Haya, and is to come, which is Haya. So they're saying, Kadesh, 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 Haya, Haya, Haya. He was holy, he is holy, he will be holy. This is how they worship the name of God. And when those seraphim give glory and honor and thanks to God that sits on the throne who lives forever and ever, Everyone in the temple prostrates, and that's my paraphrase of what comes next. Everyone in the temple prostrates, the 24 elders, everybody falls down, smoke fills the temple. When you get to church and you lift your holy hands, and Paul said, I would that all men would lift up holy hands. The reason your hands are holy is because you are spelling the name of God. He has a holy name, Kadesh, 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 Haya, Haya, Haya. And that is, and the Hayah means I am. Let's look at that here real quickly, Kadesh and Hayah together. So, Kadesh, 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 holy, 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 Hayah, Hayah, Hayah is I am, I am, I am. And when you put the same Hebrew word next to each other, what it does is it amplifies it, it magnifies it. This is not a doublet now where oh, there's only two of them. There's now three of them. Who was, he was holy, who is, he is holy, who will be holy. People have been taught falsely that this is the Trinity. There's three persons they're worshiping, but that makes no sense at all. Because when God reveals his name to Moses in the Exodus 15, he says, Haya, Haya, I am that I am. Okay, that's a double, that's a doublet. Okay, and so a triple, I am, I am, I am, I believe it means I'm Jesus Christ, the Holy One of Israel. So, he was holy, he is holy, he will be holy, past, present, and future, the revelation of God. So, Lord God is Yahweh Elohim, Almighty is El Shaddai. The seraphim worship the name of God, which gives God glory, causing God to fill the temple with his manifest presence. Now you know why so many worship songs in Christianity are towards the name of Jesus. Worshiping the name of Jesus is the triple sanctification I am, I am, I am, holy, holy, holy. That's what you're doing when you lift your hands and praise the name of Jesus. Can you say, God, uh, praise the Lord. Well, that's where we're going to stop today. And uh, we'll uh, just conclude here with uh, just a couple of comments. The book of Isaiah is found throughout the New Testament. Okay, it's quoted many, many, many times, the so 63 times. And then there's allusions. Sometimes it's sort of a faint allusion. Sometimes it's a direct quotation. But when you study the book of Isaiah, now you have some structure. Now you have some ideas about what it's talking about. And when you read it, you can enjoy it more. And that's the purpose of these five lessons. It's no accident that the book of our Bible has 66 books. Isaiah has 66 chapters. Uh, chapters 1 through 39 seem to parallel the Old Testament, 1 through 39, uh, books 1 through 39, Genesis through Malachi. 
And is it the, the remaining 27 books of the New Testament are paralleled by Isaiah, uh, the remaining uh, 40 through 66 chapters? And last but not least, is that the book of Isaiah talks about the Holy Ghost in Isaiah 28, 11 through 12. And that's the speaking in tongues experience. If you haven't had that yet, just lift your hands, praise the Lord, and allow the smoke to fill the temple and speak. God's not going to make you speak. you got to do that yourself. It's a volition of your will because God never violates your will. Many people haven't received the Holy Ghost because they think God's going to make me speak in tongues. No, it's a get to, not a have to. God forces nobody to do anything. So lift your hands and praise the Lord and give him glory and the smoke will fill the temple. God bless you in Jesus' name. We'll see you next time on another edition of 153greatfish.com.